Welcome, Happy New Year to New Year to everybody. It's the Wednesday afternoon, the 20th of January, the day before the opening of Jennifer Morrison's show, Remember to Forget. And I'll come back to the title a little later and ask Jennifer what the meaning is. So this is a, it's been a really tough year for everybody and it's been a year which, which people thought you shouldn't be promoting art. But we've decided to go ahead with the exhibition, which we'll talk about a little later, as we believe that art makers and art promoters alike have a role to play in ensuring that there's an upliftment or rejuvenation of the human spirit. And I think this is where artists have come in. So we'll discuss that a little later. It's really good, and I welcome Jennifer. It's good to have Jennifer back uh, in South Africa to attend the opening of her show in somewhat different uh, conditions and circumstances. We've had amazing shows over the last eight years. This is the fourth show we're having with Jennifer. And I remember some beautiful balmy summer evenings with fairy lights outside, flowing champagne and lovely food to eat, and an enormous crowd. But it's different conditions and different circumstances and a different time in the world, not just in South Africa. And we decided to embrace this exhibition and navigate around the challenges and obstacles we are confronted with. But the show must go on. Well, Jennifer, welcome back to Johannesburg. Thank you. You get it's around. Good to be here, I know. It's, huh? it's great to be here. All the way from the UK. All the way from the UK. Back to South Africa. Yeah. And you've been in and out of South Africa a couple of times this year. A couple of times, came out on a repack flight. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, uh, it's going to be quite tough going back to the UK with uh, you know, lockdown, and I feel very lucky that I've been able to come out here for Christmas and New Year and spend time with my family and to be able to have this exhibition. But, you know, I must say, for me, knowing you for quite some years now, um, I've definitely realised that there's a certain sort of personality trait and characteristics about you. And even with your travels, mm -hmm. you've still been able to produce one of the finest body of works I've seen you produce to date. How did you do that? Well, actually, that was one of the good things about COVID and good things about lockdown was that it really uh, gave me the opportunity to just spend loads of time in the studio. My studio is a 20-minute walk from my home. So, you know, wake up in the morning, walk to the studio, work all day, come back home, didn't see a soul, um, and just managed to produce and focus. Uh, and I think that that was one of, one of the good things for me. I've, I've missed all other sorts of aspects to life before COVID. You know, I love playing tennis. I love seeing my friends. Um, you know, I used to play snooker once a week at the Chelsea Arts Club, which I miss greatly. There are many aspects of my life that I miss that I'm sure everybody else does. But in terms of my work, um, it actually, you know, I, it, 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 was, it was a positive thing, and, uh, yeah. Because you're one of the artists, and I know, and I follow you on some of the digital platforms, that uh, makes a, a real effort to see every major exhibition at any yeah. one of the major museums. Yeah. And you also attend a lot of the contemporary galleries. Yeah. In fact, all of them show yeah, major ones. In London, and not only London, and around Europe. Yeah. So that must have been a, a big miss for you well, last year. Well, it was very sad. There were exhibitions I wanted to go to that were cancelled at the last minute. And um, I love spending a day out of the studio, walking from gallery to gallery in central London, you know, seeing what other people are making, what people are doing. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, 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 it's had a very big effect on the art world worldwide. And, you know, um, I miss being able to go to a museum or go to a gallery and see art because for all the virtual reality has its place and it's great that we can see some art online um, but for me I, I want to I want to see a painting or a sculpture or whatever it is you know with my own eyes in real life I, that's I what it comes down to the visual tactility yeah. of art yeah because most people think you look at a painting online and 
you get the same kind of resonance with it. Mm -hmm. I feel that one has to like yourself yeah. stand in front of the counter because I think you lose the, the proportion of scale. Yeah, exactly. And you don't really engage with the work and you can't pick up the texture as much. No, the materiality you can't quite grasp in the same way. And as you say, the scale in relation to your body uh, in front of it, it's, a, it's a, just a different experience. Um, so, yeah, I do miss that. But you've adjusted, like we all have to. Yeah. And I think it's something that we wanted to talk about because I think the audience needs to realize that it was touch and go whether we were going to hold the show or not. Yeah, it was. So perhaps you could just tell us what some of your reservations as to why you feel we should have gone ahead with the exhibition. Well, I, you know, um, a month ago, coming out to South Africa, the, the case numbers weren't so bad here, and certainly compared to the UK, um, and I sort of felt very confident about the exhibition. But a week ago, as case numbers were rising in South Africa, I was very concerned. I didn't want people to feel that I was just going ahead, come what may, oh, my show has to go on, and I'm sort of doing it without any care or concern. Um, and just felt that, um, you know, it might not be appropriate. But then after speaking to you and your sort of optimism and your positivity about it all, and how we can adapt and we can make this exhibition instead of one big grand opening in the evening with all the fanfare, we're opening it tomorrow from 1 p.m you know, into the evening, so people can come in their own time, they can feel safe and secure in this vast gallery space. Um, you kind of reassured me and you made me feel better about it. You made me, you know, I have made all this work and it's so wonderful to see it up on the walls. And I just hope other people at this time that they're perhaps feeling, you know, a bit down about things can sort of choose to come here and, and see some paintings and see some color and and have a good experience here. Um, so I'm very glad that you persuaded me that it was it was it was right that the show had to continue and go on. Well I think I mean I, I think for me as the promoter to you know your sensitivity to the situation both globally and locally and realizing there has been a tremendous amount of lives being lost as a yeah. result of this this COVID-19 disease, yeah. and besides the fact the the, um, the increasing of infections, it does kind of subdue the energy yeah. overall. But uh, you know, Jennifer and I did have a discussion. We were talking about this, and I think that when you look at the history of mankind and realise that this world has gone through many ups and downs, and uh, over the last 120 years, they were confronted with the first world, the first world war. Shortly after that, the Spanish flu, over 15 million lives were lost. And I don't even want to go into the centuries before that. But then we got into the, it was the stock market crash mm -hmm. and the Great Depression and, uh, and the hardships that mankind was confronted with at that time. You know, I did some reading on some of the artists that were living in Paris at the time and they had to continue making art and they had to continue exhibit, exhibiting. And a lot of the dealers as well, I mean, the sales weren't like they were early on, but the, the galleries remained open and the promoters remained promoting art and they encouraged the artists to continue creating. I mean, it's also not easy to create, that's why I'm so impressed with the work, which we'll talk about a little later. There's all that negativity that uh, peppers one's mind and psyche. I mean, it's difficult to produce such an exuberant, bright, colourful, um, enigmatic body, body of work. But I think it was important for us you know, to go back to the body of work, but to realize that this wasn't taken very lightly the decision to go through the exhibition. I just no. feel that the mood in South Africa, like everywhere else in the world, is just so subdued. But I felt this, that the artists or the art makers, like uh, the promoters, are really the lighthouses in this darkness out there that really give light and encouragement and uh, create these beautiful things that uplift the human spirit. Because I think that's what art is about. It's a transferring of your own energy. It's all your mental thoughts and your reference points on your own journey of life. And you know, you sort of brought these all in and into your mind and, and then you create spontaneously and a very free flowing energy. And I think your mind was really in a good place while you're doing this. But it's important for us to have this amazing body of work. And even though it won't, like you said, be a big rah-rah on the opening, we have a very Pretty small contained crowd, 
and within the, the government regulation. Obviously, everybody has to attend. Well, no one will be allowed in. Please don't be offended by that. Um, it's a respect for each other. If our fellow man, we all uh, wear masks. Besides the mask, there will be sanitizer available so people can uh, sanitize their hands on arriving and on leaving. Um, the other sad thing is that, uh, and then obviously we won't be able to get into close little huddles and talk. We'll have to, like today, I'd normally be sitting almost on top of Jennifer, and I would have given her a big South African hello. I couldn't do that today. We had to give each other a little elbow, which is unusual. But it's, it's, we have to respect each other, and hence we've got our social distancing. So the people that will be coming here tomorrow night, please respect that, wear your masks. The gallery is 250 square meters, and a maximum of 50 people do attend at any one point. That allows you seven and a half square meters of clear space. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty safe, and as long as we adhere to the protocols and the respect for each other, and I've had a man, the show can go on, and all of and everybody that would like to can come and attend the show. One of the other changes we have made is you know opening the show like at one o'clock in the day. Yeah. But this just allows a slow flow of people, because we've also got the curfews in place as well. They can come out and look at the works and what I like about this, it's a much more one on one yeah. experience with both yourself mm -hmm. as you'll be here, mm -hmm. and for myself the dealer, just engaging with the with the clients and so they can look at the works. And you know, artists, there's no right and wrong, it's a matter of taste and opinion. But it does give people an opportunity to to hear from you. Mm. What was the departure moment in this particular work? Was it a song? Was it like you get inspired a lot by forms and figures and rhythms and patterns in nature? Um, and you know, it's always interesting to understand what this trigger, catalytic point was to create these amazing artworks. So yes, uh, Jennifer and I decided the. The exhibition is going to continue and to open tomorrow at 1 o'clock, which is uh, Thursday the 21st, with the official speeches um, at 7 o'clock. And that will give us about 45 minutes to an hour and give us ample opportunity to all get home safely before the curfew uh, is implemented at 9 p.m. tomorrow night. Uh, bear in mind that the exhibition runs for a six week period, um, it's right until the end of February which is a good, good period to run, also because of the COVID-19, it gives, we'll have an extended period, because most exhibitions globally today are two weeks, maybe four weeks at most, but we're giving Jennifer a good six-week show, because we only do one show here every two years, and the other show is done in Mattel, which is Jennifer's uh, um, uh, sort of uh, region of birth, and, uh, and unfortunately that show we hadn't put on hold last year, so I didn't want her to miss another show. There's so much energy that goes into this. There's so much organization, so much preparation. And Jennifer is such a perfectionist in terms of how she stretches her canvases, how she prepares the canvas, how she paints. Mm. Everything is perfect. The little frames that she brought along here to guide our frame is as to how she wants done. Both the works on paper and the little oils are just magnificent. Each piece, a gem and a jewel and so on. All right, so we've got the COVID uh, protocol out of the way. Um, I'd like to ask you about the title. The title. So how did you get to the title? <laughs> yeah, well, it, I love paradoxes. I love, I love sentences that both do not and do make sense simultaneously. Yes. Um, and so I thought that Remember to forget. It was it was a, a title that sort of just came to me when I kind of made most of the work that's here today, um, because I just thought with, the, with, the, with painting, it's actually quite important to forget in the sense of not being too conscious when you're painting. I feel personally, if you're too conscious when you're working, it's 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 stifling. Um, so, in that sense, we must remember to forget, in the sense of allowing things to become, um, uh, to, to come forth from a more unconscious and subliminal level. And so, I just thought that there's also a very interesting parallel between remembering, as in being conscious of something, and seeing. Because if you are drawing something, um, if you are if you're drawing a tree and you are very conscious that it's a tree, so in a sense you're remembering that it's a tree, 
you won't draw it as well as if you just completely forget that it's a tree. So there's this, this very interesting parallel between seeing and remembering and forgetting and seeing. And um, so that's what I sort of thought would be an interesting title for the show because, um, you know, my work is abstract. It's very much coming from a place, um, from a place of intuition. There are constant themes that recur in my work, like the circle keeps coming back and tangles and lines keep coming back. I think my, my original um, influence is, is nature, is, is natural forms. I'm constantly taking pictures of plants and roots and leaves and I've got a little macro lens and fascinated by going really close up to things and seeing extraordinary patterns and, and things which just keep recurring in nature, as the, as the circle does, and as, as, as lines do, tangles constantly. And I think they also serve as a sort of metaphor for one's interior space and for you know, one's emotion and feeling. I think I'm trying to convey and evoke a feeling. Um, I'm not really too concerned about an idea as such. I actually feel ideas are very overrated in art. I think that we seem to have swerved quite a lot to needing an artwork to be about something, that it has to sort of, that, it's, that if it doesn't have a sort of purpose or convey some kind of political, social message, that it's perhaps um, that one kind of questions its validity, and I, I, I just I, I don't buy into that at all. I think I think art is essential, but for me it's essential on a very private, um, kind of quite mysterious, ineffable level. It, it, it's that which cannot be spoken. It, it's it, it stands in place of words for me. Because I think I think that's. The way you described it, because I like, I think your description of your your departure point, your how your um, how the, the process of it, because it is a process. Yeah, it is a process. Um, yeah. You know, ultimately, when you take if you take the tree, then into the tree. Yeah. You take a very high resolution photograph of the tree. Yeah. You know, it, it's just so heavy in weight in terms of its um, um, what's the word? It's particularly digital. The resolution is so high. Yeah. There's so many pixels. Yeah. It's you know it comes a really big file, mm. and yet it's just one image at a very high resolution of just this tree. Mm. Then you take that really fancy lens that you talk about, mm. and you go even further on a microscopic level mm. to look at you know just if, if, even on in a plant. Mm. In a plant, there's a lot of detail and there's a pollen. Mm. It's it, there's a lot more to it. Mm. But as I said, it's impossible for you just to replay that in the artwork. It has to be, because you've visited it, mm. you've engaged in it, you've studied it, you've experienced it, you've absorbed it, and then you've got to let it go. Yeah, it's all about transformation, isn't it? It's about... And then it becomes a fragment. Yeah, yeah. And then at the end yeah. of the day, it's, and, and, and it shouldn't be, because I think the, the world has moved. Everything's got to have be conceptual, and it must be a definitive message, either politically, or environmentally, it's got to, to give its validity. Mm. But ultimately, I think that's where, that, that's not true art because it's almost plagiaristic. Well, I have it's, no, it's, it's contrived, it's too contrived. I have no problem if that serves as inspiration for other artists. Yeah. It's not that I have anything against political art or art that makes us a political or social statement, it's just not what propels me, what excites me, which, what sends me to the studio and, and makes me pick up a brush. It's, um, so we, we all make art for different reasons and we, we all want different things from art or from a painting. And for me, um, I want a visual experience, foremost, uh, above anything else. For me, that's kind of in a way, neither here nor there. For me, 
it's the visual experience which is, is paramount and which excites me, which challenges me, uh, which inspires me. And so, yeah. Because I think that's, that's, that's accurate, because art is about a visual experience. Yeah. I actually saw an image of a tree that was burnt on the outside. And I mean, when you looked at the vascular system of the tree, I mean, it's amazing to mm. see it on a microscopic level. Mm. I mean, it's, I mean, we ever saw the movie. Those, those alien creatures that stayed, they came back to the tree of light. But the tree has such energy that it empowered and energized them. Mm. So I think we as people coming to the artworks can have an artwork like this in your home. You can actually feed it the energy because mm. there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a residue of energy in each word. And like you said, it's an intuitive experience. Mm. It's a strong visual impact, mm. which it should be. And this is a combination of little fragment of many of your personal experiences and naturalistic experiences mm. that are all brought into your mind and you're not really consciously thinking about it, you just let it flow from the, su the subconscious. Or the subconscious. Absolutely. And all the paintings, from the circle paintings and the, the tangle paintings, they're all made up of layers. So, and I think most of my work is always made up of layers. It's, you, you, you get a sense of what was there before, what comes after it, what came after that, did that come before it, did that come after it, it's a sense of history, am I obliterating what was before, or am I trying to allow what's underneath to sort of emerge through what I've put on top of it, it can be read both ways, I don't actually really know the answer, um, and, and this, you know, this is the thing about painting, you, you kind of almost paint despite yourself, you, you know, sometimes you paint a painting, or I'll paint a painting, and I think, wow, okay, I've, I've done that. You know, it's almost a surprise to myself. It's a bit like that, that experience when you sort of catch yourself in the mirror sometimes, and you think, gosh, I, I actually look like that. You know, because you're so used to seeing yourself in the mirror every day, and stuff like that. And then you suddenly think, gosh, I really do look like that. You know what I mean? It's, it's a similar kind of, um, not quite a dislocation, but a... Uh, it's almost like you're kind of standing outside of yourself, looking in at something that you've made, which is completely coming from within you, but which can simultaneously be a surprise to yourself. And I think this is interesting about us as humans, that we, we know ourselves to a certain degree, but there's so much about ourselves, which is just this vast darkness subconscious and unconscious space which is is, is is a foreign foreign world and we we say things and we do things and we make things that are as much as a surprise to ourselves as as they are to, to other people so yeah. i think this comes back to some of those cliches like take a take a leap of faith yeah yeah fortune favors the road <laughs> yeah. as they win yeah, yeah. but there's, there's there's great wisdom in some of those statements because You'll never really know the true inner being no. or what you're truly capable of, and you'll never really actualize your fullest potential until you do mm. take the deeper faith mm. as the unknown. Mm. And if you and fortune will favor you if you're courageous in spirit and lead the way. Well, one can only hope. <laughs> but open above that, Jennifer, I think you know it's always good to be uh, to talking to you because you know often to find the right word to say what you're trying to articulate to yeah. us what you're trying to say. Yeah. It's not always that easy, but sometimes the longer we talk, that's why before we started the, the interview, I said, let's just have a chat here, and it's going to be a while, just to get the neural pathways open and to start flowing. Yeah. The dialogue, the conversation is not flowing. But I mean, I look at the work and I say, even though you say it's, it's, it's got to have, art's got to have the right, it's got to be, it's a visual statement. And visually, I look at these works and I'm quite intoxicated. I mean, I've always been a great fan of Rothko, I've always been an abstract painter, as mostly Sartuni, and um, you know, these are, these are Grant de Kuhn, these are probably the three that really come to mind, and they always move me, and there's a show, which is the single work in the museum, I'm totally fascinated by it, because there's a meditative aspect to it too, mm. particularly Sartuni's mm. works, and also the application of pigment that Rothko did, and the sort of breaks between, you know, the blocks of colour, mm. um, find there's a tension between them, which I pick up with your works as well, from one layer to the next. Mm. 
So you know, often with cloth carries works, it's one colour which bleeds gently into your canvas, mm. and then there's a bit of space, and then it sort of begins again. Mm. And the energy moves, picks up, and builds up to a peak at the centre point, the next sort of block of colour. Mm. But yours, I'm finding, and the Saturni, for example, it's, a, it's almost a very gentle, meditative, um, almost like a scribe mm. writing, mm. just making a mark, but with nothing to look at. Mm. It's just intuitively flowing mm. in the spirit. Quite gentle words. And with your works, I pick up the same sort of morph, morph of, of both artists, abstract painters, where you've still got the solid planes of colour. But you've allowed the, uh, the freedom of expression uh, and interpretation to be sort of uh, completely un untamed. Mm. You know, it's wild. It's almost in nature. Not being not a really uh, um, a manicured garden, but mm. almost a garden that is just naturally organic and just develops and grows uh, naturally. Mm. That's what I'm seeing in the woods. Yet I still see the breaks. In the layers, which gives it quite a, quite a bit of feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think. Um, yeah, I, I, I tend to sort of have a feeling when I'm painting that the painting could go off the boundaries yes. of the canvas, and that it's almost kind of. I found a bit of painting. <laughs> could almost have a, a life, you know, outside the the canvas, um, and I. I you know, I love the square. These are all square paintings. I think there's something very perfect about the square, something very wonderful about how it's really you know, the same no matter how you hang it. I mean, I have a right way, but, but theoretically, it could kind of almost be swiveled around um, being a square. Um, so there is this sort of all overness and the sense that sometimes I feel, especially with these tangle paintings, that the painting sort of existed before I painted it, I captured it on the canvas and it could almost have a life, sort of almost going from left to right, perhaps because that's the way I write, I almost feel like I've kind of grasped it on the canvas, but I'm only grasping a bit of it. I like to get the sense that it could continue beyond the canvas. I think also with these, these circle paintings, there's, there's perhaps that sense. Um, I don't really know what that's about. I don't know why I do that, um, but I find that I keep doing it. The circles coming back again and again, the tangles coming back again. I mean, the circles obviously have, you know, associations of perfection, eternity, wholeness, no beginning, no ending. Um, so talking about people um, finding a way into the paintings, um, I would have thought, most people would be able to have some kind of relation to these very elemental forms, like the circle, like tangles. I mean, we talk about being in a tangle. We talk about our lives being, you know, thwarted or, 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 or constricted or, or burdened by, you know, you see a big bunch of cables and it's, it's kind of quite intimidating. It's like, how can we unravel all of this? So, I, th I think anybody would be able to s sort of s see the symbol of that, or would be able to associate with that and, and make it make something of it in terms of their associations to those those forms. Um, so uh, for me, they are um, they shouldn't there, there shouldn't be a barrier in terms of people being able to engage with them and, 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 and see them. And people can kind of take from them what they bring to the painting, because we're all bringing our own history to every painting, and that's what we're getting getting out of it. Because that's what I, I thought about that movie. The movie was actually Avita. Oh, I haven't seen that. You've got to see it. Oh, OK. With those strange-looking so, people. Strange-looking people. But no, you know I haven't it's seen so that. Beautiful. I'm such a generalist about it. Okay. And I, I think you're going to take a cross section of. I mean, I did that in Monogy Labs, and I'm sure you did. And the microscope, mm. and the masculinity mm. within the leaf mm. or in the tree. And you know, um, it's interesting with trees as well. 
because things are either phototropic, mm -hmm. hydro hydrotropic, mm -hmm. so it's you know, drawn to water, they're mm -hmm. drawn to light, mm -hmm. and the synthesis of the combination of the light and the water mm -hmm. uh, is that it creates that synth synthesis and the process of absorbing the CO2 and releasing oxygen. So I find that if you look at the human being and almost under like X-ray, mm -hmm. you'll see the, you know, the, the actual skeleton, which is the bone structure, and then if you add the musculature onto it, you look at the vascular and the fat, 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 fat. The lymphatic system, this is all like electrical cables you reference to. Mm -hmm. I look at this as, as almost live wires. And then you look at the nervous system. You've had no many associations to, to that life. linear form. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. it's all life because this is the life force. Yeah. Without these channels and these conduits, this would not transfer the energy. This would not transfer the lymph or, or the blood or the I mean, plants, the water or plasma. So, mm. You know, I, I look at your work more and more, and they have, they represent life, and an abundance of life, and almost an uncontained energy bursting at the corners and the size of the planets. It's like you said, you feel that could extend beyond them. Mm. It's almost like this, as large as they are, it's almost like a microscopic view, an aspect of a living entity on this planet. Mm. Whether it be a mammal, whether it be a plant, be a tree, that this is all it is. More than just the tangles, it's the circuits that make up any living organism. Yeah, I like circuits. That's a good circuits. word. Circuits. So we found that yeah, word yeah, together. Yeah, we found that word, yeah. <laughs> this is what I love about talking. Yeah, because you can never, you know, it's always about talking yeah. to find a description. But it's difficult it's to talk about painting. I find it very difficult actually to talk about uh, the circuits you know, of life. Yeah. Whether it is the flow of plasma, water, energy and you'll find that under a microscope any living organism is an intended band of circuits. All right, so we just came to talk a little bit about uh, one of the, the 180 by 180. So just 190 by 190. 190, I think. 190, that's almost two meters. Yeah. So they're very really large canvas and I've selected this one and the title is Forgotten and uh, it's part of the title of the exhibition. We never forget, so while Jennifer was painting this, she's obviously forgotten all the references that she made on the, on the way. But for me, it was, it's, it's the most striking work on the show because both Jennifer and I, as you can see, and maybe not today, we're both great lovers of colour. And, uh, and to me, this is just such a strong and powerful aesthetic state that I really do enjoy it. But I'm going to let the creator talk a bit about this picture. Uh, well, it's part of a series, as, as you can as you can see, and it's 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 about a, a build up of, of layers. So um, I've really worked uh, with glazes in these paintings, which is quite unusual to see uh, these days. Painters don't generally work with glazing so much mm -hmm. anymore. It's I quite of, like that. Eh? Yeah, it's it's kind of, you about yeah. That. So you know, I, I, I use the glazes to push things back paint it over to bring things forward again and to try and create this sense of depth and to try and create almost a kind of a sense of weight and to try to create a sense of weight and an entanglement and, and the sense that uh, these these lines or this this big kind of mess of lines could 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 have a, a life out, out, outside of the canvas. Right, but I'm thinking, just on the work, and almost seems three dimensional. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I was it's, just trying it's to. Yeah, trying to create a, a kind of depth. One doesn't know whether this is lifting or moving, and one doesn't know whether this is coming this way or is in fact, is in fact sinking. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really know myself. Um, I think it's up to the viewer to, to, to decide that for themselves. Um, but these paintings are really about a sense of history, I suppose, because um, they are about layering, about what's come before and what's, what's, what's coming after it. What can you see into the past? What can you see into what lies below? And what is revealed and what is uh, hidden, um, I think it 
it's, I think it's very much about entanglement, what is hidden, what is revealed, what is forgotten. I suppose that's why I gave the... the and also the, the darker thickness in the background. Yeah. And it's also got a metaphorical meaning of moving from a very dark period into a very light period, or almost a statement of promise. Yes. Which is quite relevant to where we are with the COVID thing. Yeah. Because, Something you know, in like February, March, all over the world, most of everybody was really because this is uncharted territory. Yeah. You know, it felt like the world was collapsing in on one. Yeah. And you know, the isolation, not being able to communicate and at close proximity to friends, friends and family. And not to function and navigate on a day to day basis, just the normal course of life. Yeah. It's had its limitation. So maybe on a subconscious yeah, I, I, level. Yeah, I definitely think on a subconscious, on a subconscious level. level yeah. It might have been a very dark space when you start with this. But as you work through it, and, and because you were not conscious of what you were doing, yeah. you were, the, the, the actual process of working allowed you then to grow and develop, and, uh, and it also freed you. Yeah. Almost like you were in bondage at this stage, and then after that, you, uh, as you worked and applied yourself and channeled more energy in, this freed you, yeah. and you became freer and looser and more optimistic about tomorrow. <laughs> yes. It's perhaps, perhaps that, that, is, that is what was going on in my brain so subliminally, I don't know. All I do know is that I always start with these dark marks, uh, primarily to create a, a structure in the painting. Painting needs to have some sense of structure, well, at least for me. It needs a departure point. It needs a departure point. Yeah. So, you know, the early marks are these very bold black marks, a lot of washes because I wanted to push some colors back, bring things forward, and then it's as if things are being obliterated but also brought, brought up, brought, brought to the fore simultaneously. So, yeah, um, we'll get from this. Well, yeah. this is the, the piece that I quite like. Now, Jennifer's got an amazing collection here, there's of 17 large canvases. And then we've got 40 small canvases. So we're going to have a little look at some of the small canvases. Well, Jim, thank you very much for the, the walkabout and the personal tour and giving us a little bit of background and insight into your work. And I do think that uh, I finally come to the conclusion that there is no exact fine right interpretation no. to your work. No. Your work is what it is, it's a circuit of energy. Many references to elements within nature, and one can most definitely experience the, the rhythms and the uh, patterns that you've um, created in your works, um, strong intuitive works with a great visual statement. And I think the finest aesthetic statements you've made in your work. So well done. And, Thank you. Uh, keep Thanks. up with that. Thank you. I think we're going to have a lot more COVID here. We're going to produce works of this quality. Oh, I hope so. Thank you once again Thank for you. making the time. First, to making the work. Thank you. A year and a half to produce a body of work like this. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations and well done, Jen. Well, thanks, Ben. Thank you to you for putting this show on and it hanging without it the so artists, beautifully. All I do is the uh, promoter. No, without the artist, there's no show. So, thank, thank you. you very much for your work. It's an excellent body of work. And I trust that we have a really good result. Obviously, it's a lot more tepid times. Yep. But we embrace it wholeheartedly, and I invite everyone to please. In these COVID times, we are practicing the strict COVID protocols to ensure that we don't hurt our fellow man by uh, uh, transferring an infection. And that's why we're quite sensitive to that, that every person will adhere to the, COVID, to the protocols. But do not miss the show. It's so seldom that you experience an artist as avant garde as this, as uh, edgy groundbreaking art statements that pushes the boundary. She's very brave in spirit and in soul to do this kind of thing. She never painted to please. She painted not because she even understands, but she just paints intuitively as she feels. And these are a really, this is a really strong body of work. I recommend all of you. You need a bit of colour in your life. You need a bit of energy in your life. So whatever you hang on your wall, whether it be a work on paper, a collage, a small oil, or a larger painting, you're going to feel of the energy, the inspiration that these works are for. So once again, thank you, Jennifer.
So we're heading back to London shortly, I believe, yep. to commence with the work again. She's missing her cat. Yeah. And she's uh, missing her studio. And uh, we say, on the yage, have a wonderful year in London. Okay. May you be very inspired to create some wonderful great things and continue to do so. And we'll give you feedback on the progress of the show. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Thank Maybe you. Maybe you just want to say goodbye to everyone out there. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. And I uh, hope that you enjoy the show if you choose to come along. Thank you.